So um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today at, at lunchtime for the Europeans, very early in the morning for our US uh, friends. And uh, I don't know if we have anybody coming from India so or further Southeast Asia. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, this is a subject that is um, very close to my heart, uh, women and sports. And um, Ollie had got in touch with me uh, a couple of months ago to tell me about the incredible work of Skatistan. And I thought, oh my God, this is so brilliant. I'm sure there are other programs. And I, of course, knew of the program of the Lotus Flower and introducing boxing. I said, I think we should do a panel around uh, the importance of uh, organized sports for young women. And, and I think that we kind of don't realize that it is also an issue in the developed world as well. I read a very interesting article recently, uh, and it, as I said, it's something that touches my heart. I have a granddaughter who is 14 year old, 14 year old uh, avid football player. She had to fight to get a girls football team together at her school. But I read an interesting, because she's just had a serious accident where she has had her ES, ACL and MCL, uh, ligaments broken and a meniscus. And so she's been off the, uh, the program for a while. And I read an article recently, which stated that this is very much more common among girls football players than male football players. And, and in this article, they showed that we have absolutely no research around why this is the case. And the article was just guessing at why, well, it could be this, it could be that, it could be the other. And it really brings to light that um, women in sports is still uh, underrepresented all over the world. At the same time, I also recognize how valuable it is to young women. So I sadly have a daughter who has cancer. She's the mother of my 14 year old. Uh, a granddaughter and sports has been such uh, a support during this really difficult time. So when I had the opportunity to meet these three incredible founders where sport has been a central part of their programs, I thought this is the moment we've got to talk about it and send out the positive news. So I got in touch with our dear, dear, wonderful Lauren Rumble, who is one of our go-to uh, moderators and always has been very willing, no matter the time, no matter where she is, she's at an airport now to moderate for Giving Women. Lauren is a director of gender and equity at UNICEF, uh, who is a great partner for us. And I would like to pass on uh, the, 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 the mic to Lauren just to say to everybody, please put your questions uh, in the chat box. We will be monitoring the chat box. And if you have a question which is relevant to what somebody is saying, we will then in interrupt and bring, the, uh, bring that uh, question to our speakers. So I'm super excited and thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Atalanti. What a wonderfully warm and very personal welcome. I'm so sorry to hear about your daughter and granddaughter. In fact, those are not easy injuries or illnesses. Um, my thoughts are with you. Um, so I'm delighted to moderate today. What a fantastic panel, especially on a subject that actually I feel deeply about, but don't know a lot about. So I'm going to be very much in learning mode. I apologize for the background noise. I am indeed on my way to Pakistan. So I'm in a noisy airport in the uh, New York JFK, for those of you who've seen it, it's chaotic, but in the chaos is a lot of um, beauty and interest um, and diversity, which we'll be talking about today. I wanted to share as kind of some background that UNICEF is, for the first time, we now have our very own girls advisory group, which is a group of young women from around the world who are advising us on our own adolescent girl work. And we had our first meeting last week and I asked them, what is it that's important to you? What would you like to imagine the world for girls to look like by 2030 when the sustainable development goals supposedly have been achieved? And across the world, across all these different languages and backgrounds, and we had girls really from everywhere, whether from war zones or um, rich countries, poor countries, middle income, they said the same kind of things. They wanted equality for everybody, for girls and boys and children and diverse um, identity. They also wanted freedom 
freedom for girls to make their own choices, freedom over their uh, bodily rights and autonomy, freedom just to decide what to do with their lives. And the third thing that they wanted was power. They wanted access to their own resources um, and they wanted to be able to really like learn things at school, education and to be safe while learning is part of that powerful future. Um, and then what was really lovely is as we ended, a lot of them talked about and we just want other girls to have fun. We want them to feel good. Our lives can be really, really hard, they said. Um, what we want to do is to just be happier and enjoy. And we wish that for other girls. And sports is something that gives so much joy, no matter where I've traveled, um, whether really, really tiny villages in Uganda uh, or in Afghanistan. Girls are playing sports thanks to organizations like those online today that are creating space for girls to defy stereotypes and really be joyful and express power, their own power. I've also seen in my own life what a liberating thing it is to engage in sports with others and to feel really good and confident about being part of the team. So um, without further ado, I want to invite you all to put into the chat perhaps what sport you're playing um, and what are you enjoying in the sports world? Mine is hiking um, or swimming, and I actually just learned to ski in America two weeks ago from South Africa, so that was really hard to do, and I thought I was going to fall and break my ACL as well, um, or tear it, or whatever it is you do to ACLs, um, but I conquered it, and I love it, so I highly recommend I Anyway, to say that sports truly touched my heart and um, make life just better. So with us today, we have um, just some fantastic people, and I'm going to start with you, Ollie, if you don't mind. Tell us a little bit more about Skaterstan um, and why you started it, what you find inspiring about it, and maybe a little bit about you. What would you like the panel to know about you? And then I'll go to you, Tiban, and then to France. Hi, everybody. Really uh, lovely to be here today. I'm Oliver Perkovich from Skaterstan and uh, originally from Australia. And uh, Skaterstan uh, came about not from my idea of going to Afghanistan and starting a skateboarding program there, but really from uh, having the opportunity to travel to Afghanistan and meeting the kids on the street and they just wanted to ride my skateboard. Um, I've been skateboarding since I was five years old. I'm turning 49 this year. So uh, it's been a, a lifelong passion. And I was just thrilled when girls were interested to were interested in the in the skateboard. And I realized that girls were blocked from doing other activities like soccer because it was seen as a sport for boys. And with the with with skateboarding being something brand new that nobody had seen before, um, this was a this was a loophole and this was an opportunity. And uh, I gave uh, <clears throat> I gave girls more time to skateboard than boys uh, in little sessions on the streets of Kabul, and it grew into something an international organisation where we're now in twelve locations around the world. Uh, it's linked to education because that was also what was very important to uh, the, the the children, and uh, they they really wanted to. They really wanted to express themselves and have a new identity, and that was something that that skateboarding could could give them, as well as a connection to to education. So all of our programs have actually come from the kids themselves. Uh, firstly, the, the the interest in in doing skateboarding, but then the interest in in education. And uh, we established schools in uh, in Afghanistan that continue to run, also under the Taliban now, um, uh, as well as in many other many other many other countries. And it's a it's a very effective. Um, it's a, it's a it's something that's worked very well over the last fifteen years. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ollie, and thank you for sharing a little bit about you. How nice um, that this program has survived the Taliban. Not an easy thing. I went under immense shutdowns. I'm really enjoying the chat, by the way. It seems like we have some competitive um, sporting heroes and also those who are learning new things and those who have diverse hobbies. Um, it's its passion that unites us. Um, and we'll leave the call with more skills, just like the girls learning um, 
skateboarding and skate assembly. We'll be looking at a video shortly after we've done the introductions so we can see more about your work in action. Um, so Taban, over to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your wonderful organization. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you so much to Giving Women as well. I'm really excited to be on this panel. Um, so I'm the founder and CEO of the Lotus Flower, and we support women and girls impacted by conflict and displacement. And we have SDG pillars aligned, um, four SDG pillars, which are peace building, human rights, um, education and livelihoods, health and safety, and climate change is one we've added recently. Now, the Lotus Flower was born, I guess, from personal experience. I'm a genocide survivor myself, so I was a child political prisoner, and I escaped being buried alive and came to the UK as a refugee at the age of six. Now, I do remember uh, sports playing a really big role in my life. I used to be in a football team when I was a teenager, and my dad, strangely, didn't let my uh, brother join a football team, but let me join. So that was the first kind of experience of sport for me. Um, and that kind of stuck with me. And for the Lotus Flower, when we started the Boxing Sisters, um, so we work with women and girls that are impacted by the ISIS conflict. So a lot of the Yazidi women and girls that were taken, raped, enslaved by ISIS. So really traumatic experiences. And I remember at the time when I was researching it, I went to uh, a, a military commander base that was set up for Yazidi women. And as Kurds, we have um, Peshmerga, so women freedom fighters, we've always had them. And they'd set up this force, especially for Yazidi women. And I was speaking to the commander and asked him, why have you set up this particular force for this group? And his response was, they've got so much anger to channel there's nowhere for it to be channeled. And so we've created this force and they can go out and fight. And so they have that freedom to do that. But at the same time, the most important thing for us is that we're allowing them and giving them a space to channel their anger. And that made me really, really think because at the Lotus Flower, we were trying to think about what programs we could start implementing to help through the mental health and the trauma that they'd experienced. And well, we can't set up a military force, um, but I thought what contact sport is good for mental health and what would really help them channel their emotions and boxing came up top. Um, now I know we're in a very conservative society, so I didn't really know how that was gonna go down. I had to wait for the right timing. I had to wait to build the community's trust before we could go in. But once we did that um, and we implemented the project, it was absolutely phenomenal to see the reaction and the response and how it was taken by the community. Um, so we implement various projects in our centers under those pillars and boxing is one of them. And it kind of falls under health, but it also falls under income generation because as you can imagine, when we implemented the project, we couldn't find any um, women boxing trainers. So what we did is we had a partnership with someone here who went out and trained a group of women. And so we hired them to kind of implement the projects in our centers. So it kind of grew out of uh, immense need, but thinking also creatively, how can you support from a mental health angle as well as the physical angle? Um, because therapy, uh, mental health services, really vary from community to community and there's a big stigma around um uh, accessing therapy in the region this, this has definitely got better over time and it's got better with more programs being implemented and more education kind of going out there but but i think thinking about how we can approach it in different ways has been something really unique with the way that we've done it and boxing isn't something that was being used in the region. Um, it's been an absolute success. It's picked up so much um, coverage, not only around the world, but also within the communities. And it's a very popular program and the girls absolutely love it. Thank you so much, Stefan, and also for sharing your extraordinary circumstances and how you've really challenged that, those challenges into something so beautiful. In fact, I'm just kind of connecting now that all three of you are builders and creators, really starting something from scratch. Um, we'll have to get to some of that later in case anybody wants to ask, how did you do it? Um, how did you manage to actually build organizations? And when do you know when to let go? Um, Franz, let's turn to you for a second now. 
tell us a little bit about Yuba, um, that it's not a television company um, and what it does. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you're on mute, by the way, friends. That often happens. Uh, Yuba means youth in Hindi. And I, in monsoon of 2008, I moved out to, to Jharkhand, um, which at that time I knew nothing about and, and was um, more known for insurgency and, and violence uh, than, than anything else. And uh, I'd been working for as a corporate social responsibility consultant, uh, but I, I moved out to work for a nonprofit and I ended up in my spare time working with kids and and uh, my friends and I created a scholarship fund uh, that we were initially very proud of. And then we realized that, uh, that the reason it was such a failure was that uh, the boys that we moved into uh, a private school from a government school were, they were unprepared um, and they needed more help, but the girls were actually not going to school at all. So their, their parents were happy that we had moved them into a prestigious school, but they saw it as more of a path towards uh, getting a better husband uh, in an arranged marriage than anything else. Uh, and one of the girls said she wanted to play football. And I said, well, you know, I've, I've been coaching ever since I was a kid myself, although alpine skiing was, was really my, my sport uh, and not so much football. And uh, so we, we started doing that. And I thought it would be something that, uh, that they would want to do occasionally. And uh, and they ended up wanting to, to play uh, seven days a week uh, during the long days of the summer, twice a day. Uh, they were scheduling their practices before sunrise so that they could continue to do uh, all that was expected of them in terms of house chores and, and everything, not really going to school very much. Uh, but I realized that, you know, after having spent at that time a, a couple of years in India, it was really the first uh, effective means of of bringing kids together and especially girls uh, in a place where uh, where I saw that while boys were playing, girls were always working. Uh, they were always doing something in the service of their own families. You see boys, you know, walking around talking on their cell phones, but but girls would be always carrying a heavy load. And it um, the football really took off in a way I hadn't expected, and um, and then. In a Mumbai slum in, in 2012, I, I met my, my now wife, who, uh, who after you know, three years, we you know, worked together. She said, I, I'm, I'm feeling like uh, if we don't start a school, then our motto of putting girls' futures in their own hands really is, um, is not honest. Uh, and so she, uh, she founded a school, which I was very, very skeptical uh, that it would actually work. Um, and that has been, I would say, the, the biggest success uh, in, of our program over the past eight years. And so that if we think of this program in the, in the girls' lives as sort of a tree, the football is sort of the roots. It, it gives them the, the confidence, the camaraderie, the community that you can get through a very positive team environment. And of course, as we know, Team sports can can definitely provide the opposite type of environment as well, but when it's done when it's done well, it can, you know, truly be uh, a life changing experience, um, especially uh, for for those who need it the most. And then the the school has provided the the tools, uh, you know, really a way forward. And and I think one big surprise was that uh, I've been coaching, you know, these these girls for 300, 310 days a year and. It wasn't until about a year into having a school that uh, that the girls who were starting to coach really became good coaches and and instead of acting acting out sort of how their government school teachers had been, uh, they started to be more empathetic, uh, more comfortable, better communicators, asking questions, and and instead of you know lines, laps, and lectures. Uh, they were just starting to be comfortable and and be kind and uh, and uh, and now it's um, it's really been a, a life changer for for many girls. Uh, we're definitely smaller than many NGOs, but I believe that we have the largest cadre of female coaches in India. What a great result, France! Um, I I liked so many things about what you said, especially 
um, while the boys are playing, you notice that the girls were always working in service of others. Um, and indeed, the global data would keep that out. We're seeing something like um, across surveys worldwide, girls are doing two to three times more household chores than their male siblings, which of course compromises their schooling and their play, but also really is representative of girls' role in society still, um, no matter where you are and how important it is to disrupt that through programs like this. Um, really, really great sharing. We're going to go now, um, Franz and Oli and Taban all started to allude to what the results of their programs are. We're going to watch a short video, if that's okay, Kathleen, are we ready? Um, that shows a little bit about the work in particular of Skaterstan. I loved watching it last night. I hope you do too. Over to you. When I skateboard, sometimes it feels like I'm flying. I had never been to any sports days because there wasn't any available for girls. Skateboarding is for everybody, not just one person. I feel safe, I feel free. I feel proud. They play together, learn, and help each other. We like skating together because it's nice holding hands. هر وقت دوستانم از من کمک بخواهد من آماده کمک هستم. We are watching our kids becoming more confident. to ensure that no child is left behind. and Ollie and Taban, we want to be part of what you're doing. Um, amazing. What a, I got goosebumps watching that even for the second time. Thank you so much for fabulous music. And I just, um, some of these quotes just stay with me. It's nice holding hands. Friendship, fun, and the future. Sometimes I feel like I'm flying. So Ollie, tell us a little bit about the flying. What kinds of results are you seeing when girls are flying in your program? What does that look like? Um, what are the other results of the knock-on effects in communities, uh, boys even? Um, and if you could dwell a little bit maybe on um, the inclusivity, those who have disabilities and maybe struggling, how you accommodate those. Sure, thanks. Um, I think, you know, when, when, when you ask about what does it look like, I think sometimes it is so visual and that's that's literally a girl coming into a new space and she's looking at her feet her whole um posture is just very 
withdrawn and you can just tell like what sort of opportunity she's had how easy it is for her to communicate with others uh, what sort of power she has within the family within uh, within community within society and uh, with the skateboarding program and even just two weeks or three weeks of, of spending time uh, in uh, in our in our programs, this is specific a specific example in in Kabul, where the the shoulders open up, the the posture is different, looking around, laughing, uh, making friends with with others. This that is the power of uh, of sports, where in a in a in quite a short time, you. So, uh, a girl can feel like she can do something that she never thought that she'd be able to do. So I think it can be quite a, a, a quick and in your face um, visual difference um, in in terms of the and 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 that that makes it so easy to just keep on going because there's so much joy in the in the children's. Uh, in the children's faces, you can tell the the relationships that are building, and then to to sort of talk about other um, a, re a really nice example I think is from uh, northern Afghanistan where uh, we we established the school in Mazar Sharif, which was three times the size of the one in Kabul, so I had the capacity for around uh, fifteen hundred children weekly in the in the programs, and uh, with Round about 55% girls participation in that program, that meant that there were 800 girls coming to that place every week for, for sports. That made it the highest concentration of female skateboarders anywhere in the world. There was nowhere else where 800 girls came to the same spot and did th this specific uh, did this specific sport. And that was simply by organizing ourselves, building the school, doing that, building it up. But it was also the fact that this was completely run by Afghans them, themselves in in uh, in Mazar Sharif, and uh, Zainab, who actually who's our country manager for Afghanistan, was leading the the Mazar Sharif school at the time, and she was very interested to involve the Jogi community, which is a nomadic uh, community in. Uh, in, in Afghanistan and that has a pretty much zero literacy rate for, for girls. And she wanted to really involve the Jogis in the, in the program. So she went out there with the, the skater stand bus and tried to talk to the elders and ask them whether it would be possible to bring the girls into the program. And they said no, <laughs> because they didn't trust her. They didn't trust the, the program. They didn't know what it was all about. And she didn't give up. All she did was she brought the program to the camp. She brought uh, educators to the to the to the tents where they were. She set up a, a back to school program where they did uh, accelerated learning of the the regular school curriculum. Um, and uh, over a couple of months, there was trust built up with with the elders. They then allowed the children to come to skater stand they started to to skateboard they started to do all of these other activities as well and they got back into school as well and they were the first girls to then enter the i mean the first literate women from that um fr from from that ethnicity and and that happened through a skateboarding program and, th and that's also that's that's what's possible um, globally now we have around a quarter of a million participations in our in our programs um, annually. Uh, we're looking to build that out to much, much, much beyond that. And uh, I think that that's possible through the fact that we've been very open about how we how we run things and how we are very, interested in sharing knowledge and information about what works and uh, since skater stand started a lot of other skateboarding projects have popped up around the world inspired by what we were doing and we've now shared knowledge with those um, our knowledge since 2018 in a quite structured way to help them not make the same mistakes that we make to help them grow out and there's now yeah 750 uh, organizations 
in over 100 countries uh, that uh, we're, we're sharing information with that can be part of including girls, um, including children living with disabilities. A lot of our disability programming has been done together with um, experts. Um, Swedish Committee for Afghanistan did a lot of work with um, uh, disabled uh, uh, children, li uh, children living with disabilities in, in Afghanistan. So we had a big program with them, which included uh, deaf students. So I think you saw in that video, there were um, instructors doing sign language with the, with the deaf students and they were, they were skating also blind students was possible. We've got a very big program in, uh, in Cambodia as well, together with the, the deaf school. And uh, we actually added um, a new sign in Khmer sign, which is skateboarding. So this is, a uh, th th there's, there's actually, yeah, that, that, that came through, uh, that, but it's usually a collaboration with, with experts that are working with those and, uh, skateboarding or other sports could be an excellent, uh, excellent add on, but, um, yeah, the, the activities are designed to be as inclusive as possible. And that, that, that's something that builds so much. Thank you, Ollie. We're getting in the chat that people love the new sign language. Talk about impact, a lasting impact. And also, you know, really distilling your top tips for a program that works. Um, talking about uh, the linking to other services. That's something France referenced that, you know, um, a sport alone needs to be linked to a school or an education. Um, the mentoring through coaching, um, as well as the trust building in the communities. And Taban, you had talked about that too. I wonder if you want to talk about your own impact and maybe some challenges you've encountered. Uh, I just want to acknowledge as well that we've got some uh, participants who started their own sports. I encourage you to also be asking Oli for his further top tips um, on his experience and, and how he got as far as he did with a quarter of a million girl reach and over 700 similar organizations going. That's a, what we might call a movement. Over to you, Tabak. Thank you. Thank you, Oli. I think we need to talk to take it to Kurdistan. So that's definitely one on the list. Um, thank oh, you so yeah. much. Um, so in terms of impact, the impact has been great. I guess let's start with the challenges. The challenges that we faced, originally I was very scared to take boxing to the region because it wasn't something that was used for women and girls in a conservative region. So I didn't really know how the reaction would be. Um, and I think that the key element in that was waiting for us to know that we've built the trust within the community. You're working within a community that's been severely traumatized. Um, the impact of ISIS was so deep that you had to kind of approach it sensitively. So when we knew that we were we had built that trust within the community, it was a lot easier for us to implement our projects. Um, and in terms of the impact, the impact has been great from changing the perception of women and girls and what they can do so they can do something and breaking barriers of those cultural perceptions. Um, confidence building. So like Ollie said, when they start and come to the programs, they're in a particular, like their body is physically in a particular way, their facial expressions, their energy. But once they've had a few sessions, it's completely different. They've just blossomed. Um, the mental health aspects are so great. It really, really has helped them channel emotions and, and it goes hand in hand. So our programs have, we have psychologists in our centers as well. So we try and integrate and approach it very holistically. Um, as I said, we use it as an income generating program as well, because we we train and hire from within the community. Um, and also, I think an important element of why it's been so successful within this community is the element of protection and safety. Now, these women and girls were, you know, the horrific, traumatic experiences they, that they had in the hands of ISIS, to be able to give them something, a, a tool where they feel like they are empowering themselves through protection and safety was really, really critical. And also, it's also an element of peace building within the community. So when, when that conflict happened, you had a lot of breakdown within the communities. And so bringing girls into one room from different parts of the community enabled it to be part of a peace building program. Now I can kind of highlight the success and the impact of the success through one um, amazing story. And 
So we had, when, when we took our trainers to the region to train a group of women, we trained one of the women who was a, a ISIS captive. So she'd been recently rescued. She was a single mother. So her husband was killed in front of her and her, the family, so all the children. The sons were taken to become um, ISIS soldiers. Uh, the mother was captured by ISIS. She was raped, enslaved. And her seven-year-old daughter was also taken by ISIS. And her seven-year-old daughter was taken by ISIS and sold on to three different men as was, and was raped for three years. Now, when she was rescued and brought back to the camp, um, she couldn't walk and she never left that cabin. So she refused to leave the cabin. She left school. She wouldn't go anywhere. She refused to kind of see anyone. And we didn't know that she had a daughter. And it just so happened that when I was visiting um, one time, I spoke to her and said, oh, and she invited us back to her tent to have tea. So we went back and I realized that she had a 12 year old girl. And I asked, how come you've not come to the centers? Because we've got lots of programs that you'd really enjoy. And the mother said she won't do anything. She will not go out of the cabin. She's left school because of this experience. She feels very different to all the other girls. And I just said, why don't you just come boxing? Just come for one session. I'll be there tomorrow. Your mum will be there. You can see if you like it and just try it. If you like it, great. If you don't, you don't need to come back. And so she came the next day and she was very, very scared at first and then slowly realized in that room and in that space, all the girls, all they did was just box. Everyone is just completely focused on boxing. So she felt safe, first of all, she felt very safe. And then secondly, she felt like she was the same as all the other girls, everyone was boxing. So you didn't need to think about anyone. She didn't feel different. So she came back to another session and then another session and then another session. And three months later, her mum sent me a photo and said, um, she's back to school. So that was the moment where I thought, okay, this is exactly why we've implemented this project because it really does allow you to go in and channel those emotions, but also allows you to feel like you can take on the world. It, it, it's that feeling of I can do anything. And that enabled her to go back to school. And so when they were resettled into another country, it was a lot easier for her to adjust because she'd already taken those steps of going out of the cab and going into the boxing sessions. And then from there, going back to school and then making friends. And so she started to become integrated into the community and that allowed them to be able to move out of the country. Because without her doing that, there's, the mum says she, they wouldn't have been able to go because it would have been too hard to convince her to leave. Um, so I think for me, when I, whenever I think about the power of boxing and the power of sports, that's exactly where that's that's exactly what I think about. And in terms of other, we have other sports programs which are equally as powerful. We have um, so we implement daily exercise, but yoga and meditation are key in some of our centers, and they're actually key activities in our youth suicide prevention program. So we have a vulnerable group of um, girls and boys who who really need the support and as well as the boxing that's available to them we do other holistic programs that allows them to kind of connect with their emotions a little bit more and actually it's just been absolutely phenomenal so for me the impact and obviously the impact on the family so you've seen the impact on the community and the family and the individual you see it on different layers It's an extraordinary both individual story and um, the multiple layers that you described, Saban. I think people in the chat are really recognizing the courage and resilience of everybody involved. And what stands out to me also is um, how it was you that took the effort to do the face-to-face -face meeting and you believed in that little girl to go boxing. Um, and that is what we know from effective skills, uh, building programs, sports and beyond is that it takes someone to believe in a girl, to encourage her to attend the classes, to encourage her to connect to peers. So, um, and often we forget that piece. So thank you to Ben for your really
personal outreach and thinking about every individual that you reach with. Um, so we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, I think people are both very moved and inspired to act as well as asking a couple of practical questions. One of them is around how can we maintain connections? And thank you, Kathleen, for noting that this recording will be up on YouTube. How cool is that? My son will love that. Um, and also that you know everyone's background materials, the names of the organizations, links to their work, including that inspiring video will be available in the chat. Um, we also had a question from Nigeria around um, a sports club that's been started for girls with a couple of like really practical questions like um, how do we pay for camp fees? Um, how do we work well with sports facilities? Um, anybody want to take that? I'm just looking at your faces. So some of the practical costs and, and maybe fundraising around that. Sure. Well, we're we're running a, a football for good organization and and certainly funding has has been a challenge for us. Um, we, for a couple of years, we were using, my friends and I were using our own funding. And then once we went beyond that, um, we had to start finding out how do people, how do people fundraise? You know, we had no idea. I didn't come from a, I didn't come from a charity background. I think the only, you know, uh, charity stuff I had done was when I was um, in elementary school and we would go door to door selling magazine subscriptions to raise money for, uh, for things. And, um, uh, so we, we did a lot of trial and error. We were trying to get funds locally um, in a place that, um, that definitely did not have a culture of uh, charity beyond, um, beyond maybe giving to temples. Um, there was a lot of suspicion around nonprofits and I think rightfully so. Uh, I was on a bus uh, with, a, a you know, sat down next to a guy who, was asking me, you know, what work I was doing. And I said, you know, we've got this nonprofit trust. And without missing a beat, he was uh, planning how we would, uh, uh, you know, try to <clears throat> steal money from the government together. And, you know, I think that's people's perception a lot of times of, of nonprofits in the area with, that we work from. So um, I don't know what, uh, what laws you have in Nigeria for corporate giving, but in India, we have something called um, a, a Companies Act, which requires companies to give 2% of their profits to charity. Now, <clears throat> many, many do not, um, but companies who do want to be in compliance um, oftentimes do do that. And then uh, we've had to decide, you know, what is it that we're special at? What makes us special? Uh, certainly not size, um, but impact and uh, impact, honesty, transparency, uh, you know, true stories that that the girls in our program have um for the longest time i mean for many many years we we were trying to convince you know everybody that we were talking to that our girls were on this incredible track and people who would come out would realize it but people who were far away were skeptical and then we had our first graduating class in in 2020 uh, and they got uh, more than half a million dollars worth of of scholarships uh, for for university and all but one of them got a, a full scholarship and we have one at Harvard and many many at other good schools and and these are not we didn't do any kind of a talent hunt so to, to your question I think um, really maybe teaming up with with uh, industry associations and asking what their members are interested in supporting um, it may be that they have some hang-ups about about NGOs like like in India, where they want to know that they're honest and they want to know that they're not going to mess up their um, their public relations, and then really going about trying to find a, a fit and maybe trying to you know meet with people in person and find out what you're special at and and what their requirements are and seeing if there's a fit. Thank you, Franz. Thank you for bravely taking on. I think resource mobilization is common to everybody, no matter how large or small your organization is. And what I really loved about what you talked about was emphasizing again, which is a common theme from today, the trust in the communities, the expansion with partners, not trying to do it alone, um, and ultimately just doing good work. That was the advice I once got early on in my career when I was like, what is fundraising? How do you even go about it? Just do good work. Um, and I think people really start to believe in both you and the work that you do. 
Um, we have a great concrete question you've mentioned, France, about associations and teaming up. Um, Raisa would like to know about programs that are innovating to include those with special needs. I think, Ollie, you started to answer that. And um, they're talking about tennis aid association with um, methodologies for broader populations. Um, Oli, I don't know if you want to pick up and just elaborate a little bit more on how you partnered with experts or Taban, perhaps. I'd also like to touch on this issue of violence, uh, particularly for you, Taban. Um, you know, we know that it's just a reality for girls at home and in their communities or because of the context that they're in. It's just extraordinary numbers of girls are drowning in violence. And coming to these programs um, with that um, history, how do you both prevent violence in your settings? How do you make sure that it's safe? I'm really curious about that. And when you've got, you know, girls having very close interaction with coaches, which may or may not be um, female or male or somebody else, how do you make sure that those coaches are um, adhering to a really strict code of conduct? I'd love to hear that. So we have a question about inclusivity, my own bias around violence and, and protection from that. Um, maybe I'll ask you, Taban, and then go to you. Thank you, Lauren. Great question. Um, so for us, I mean, globally, gender-based violence is a big issue. I think in the camps, it's a lot more concentrated. And in the communities that we work in, it's a, it's a big issue that we face. We try and implement a gender-based violence lens to everything that we do. Um, and I think with boxing, so at the moment, the way we're currently running the programs is especially through a gender-based violence lens. And that is starting off with awareness sessions. So we do a lot of awareness sessions in our centers. And actually, you'll be surprised at how much information people do not know, especially women and girls, when, when it comes to their rights, when it comes to what they can do, when it comes to safety and education. So we start our sessions with, like the programs are started with awareness sessions around gender-based violence. A, what it is, how to spot the signs, um, what happens if you're in that situation, where you can get help, how you can get support. So they're fully aware of it. So that's the education piece around that. But then also the physical training piece empowers them to feel safer um, and for them to actually feel like they feel safe that they can kind of walk around the camps and do stuff like without fear that's one in terms of the trainers well our staff are always vetted by um, the local police so we don't hire anyone unless they're completely vetted um, our trainers are women and that's why we partnered with an organization in the UK to go back and train a group of women. And it's not just a group of women, it's a group of women like from the camps. So they really know them, they're within the community. So the trust is very, very deep. Two, from a safe pointing and compliance perspective, we have compliance feedback boxes. So we have anonymous boxes that are kind of locked and you can put feedback into them. And we encourage people in the centers, women, girls, staff, anyone from the community, we, we've raised awareness and say, if there are any issues and you're too scared to put your name forward or you can't mention who you are, just put the feedback in anonymously and we'll pick up. So we have um, good ways of monitoring it. And also from a monitoring perspective, there are layers within our um, structure for us to monitor the coaches and kind of evaluate their performance, staff kind of go on performance. Um, so we have, I guess, the due diligence around it, the safeguarding policies, we, we ensure that they're kind of implemented properly. Um, it's very, very important when you're working with um, women and girls, especially when, within this community and they feel safe and there's that level of trust that they can come forward and say anything and talk to us. But we are so integrated into the community that they feel that they can do that. And for us, gender-based violence is always brought into any programming that we do. There will always be an angle around that. And as well as that, they we, we provide psychologists. So we kind of do it from a holistic approach. If there is an issue, then we've got somewhere for them to go to kind of heal the full cycle. Thank you so much, Taban. That sounds really like, um, you know, serves global good practice, but actually come to life. Um, and that's not an easy thing to do um, from building the trusts to creating the referrals that actually work um, to recognizing violence as a reality and really mitigating against that. 
for being part of the recovery. Um, I don't know if um, Oli wanted to respond on both the disability question and this one, perhaps I can imagine it's a reality for you too in your programs. Yeah, I, I think with, I mean, starting with the, the question around uh, resources, um, making sure that you've got three legs to stand on is the best, uh, the best advice that I can give to uh, in terms of in terms of fundraising, just really make sure that you've got diversified support. Leading on from having the resources, getting girls involved, and also building our programs with disabilities costs more money per participant, and you've got to make sure that you're actually prioritising that and doing that. We spend about eighty percent of our resources in Afghanistan getting fifty percent girls to take part. That means that you are to create that safe space to build that trust with community. All of those things that Javan was just uh, talking about. We're doing. Uh, we have transport for the girls. We don't have it for the boys. We have. Um, we do home visits with the with the girls to build the trust with the families, and uh, all of that takes resources and and time. And that's really really important in terms of creating that safe space. And uh, right at the start, Lauren, you, you uh, talked about those five uh, things that the, the youth uh, delegates, uh, representatives uh, came up with, and safety was one of them. And when, when safety is there, then all of those other things can come out of it. You can have your fun, you can feel your freedom, you can have power, but you first have to create that safe uh, safe space. And that's really, 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 really important. Um, including uh, children living with disabilities in, in programming means then the upskilling the staff to be able to do it as well as putting the resources towards, uh, towards it. So our staff learning, taking the time to learn sign language, to be able to work with those um, those those children uh, and finding experts, other experts in the area that you can work together with is is really helpful to move that program as far as fast forward as as possible. In Afghanistan, we have different days for boys and girls, and the girls have a girls only environment, and that's really essential to win over the trust of the community and to actually make it make it work. That costs us a whole lot more money because we can't just employ people part time. In many places, we have to provide full time work. But we say don't come to work on these days because there's girls there. That's just a part of the, the cost of the programming and, and making it effective over, over overall. Um, so that's 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 some, um, and then I guess yeah, building in those um, uh, yeah gender-based violence uh, curriculum uh, for for children of all all ages, boys and girls. It's really important to 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 have um, programs that fit and and can connect with them where they're at on those um, to, to build awareness of, of what is, uh, of, of, what's imp of what's important. Um, I think that's. You that gave us a really comprehensive and thoughtful response, Oli. You know, um, I think it was you, Franz, that talked about a sort of failure that you've had um, in the, when you started off initially with a scholarship program and then turning that failure into success. I'm a huge fan of learning from failures and things that didn't work. And I think you Oli, also talked about uh, pitfalls that you've come across. Um, you know, we tried in Tajikistan to, we'd had such a successful innovation lab project with youth, but mostly attended by boys. And so we tried to start one for girls and then noticed that literally no one was coming. <laughs> um, and it, it took what you're talking about, Oliver, it took really direct outreach, dedicating real funds and connections with the community um, to understand why that was and then take action to address those gaps. Things like permission from parents, changing the, the operating hours, making the hubs closer to where girls were, um, 
So, you know, really, I think that kind of direct outreach and noticing that things are not just automatically going to happen for girls because it's a good idea is really, really important. Um, I don't know if anybody wanted to talk about their own failures or other reflections you're having from the chat. I want to just point out that the connection is already starting. We've got so many people who want to help you and join you. Um, Jenna from UN Women has put in a link inviting social entrepreneurs on the call, including our beautiful panelists. Um, to sign up and she's offering to be a referral for you. Um, and we also have a fossil chair from Nigeria talking about the impact of their own program on sports for girls. Um, so let me just see if any of our panelists wanted to respond to anything that might be coming up for you now. So I'm, I'd, I'd like to touch on on safeguarding. You know, I, um, I was listening intent to, intently to, to what Taba um, Taban was, was saying. Am I saying your name right? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, what Talvin was saying about trying to vet uh, staff coming in, and um, you know, for for all of us starting a program, you know, it's it's worth nothing if if we're creating unsafe spaces, and and sport for all it, for all its good can also be a a place where very bad things happen. Um, and I I think um, initially, uh, you know, with my uh, you know, kind of uh, starry-eyed, uh, you know, view of of what it was that we were doing from about, well, from 2009 until um, mid 2012. I was, I thought we were going to that our growth was going to be explosive because I was looking at demand for the programs among girls. Um, what I wasn't looking at was our ability to supply safe coaching, um, and so uh, two of the the first. <clears throat> Uh, guys that I was training as as coaches, um, one of those started having an inappropriate relationship, uh, romantic relationship with a 12 year old girl, and he was in his early 20s, and it was one of those things where, like everybody was seeing it uh, but me, uh, you know my my Hindi was quite poor back then. I was sort of um, you know very naive, and at so in in 2012 our you know we we had to you know hit reset and um, and. You know, try to decide whether or not to continue this program, and um, and um, you know, it was it was complicated, and um, uh, you know, the the guys that we we fired came back and tried to you know uh, prevent girls from coming to the program, tried to destroy the program, and um, and uh, at at that point, I had to decide, you know, what you know, who are we, and and how do we actually provide coaching to girls, and you know, as as a lot of us have seen, if, if you make a program for boys, you'll only get boys. If you make a program for girls and boys, you'll only get boys. If you make a program for girls, you'll still get a bunch of boys. So, you know, to to make it safe, you know, when we're not within four walls of a of a center, we're out in you know many different communities all over the place. Um, you know, the the solution we came up with was that we had to have girl coaches, but in a place where girls don't play football, how do you create girl coaches? In a place where girls don't um, have access to education, how do you help them to become teachers of a sport? And the solution was was basically that that um, I, along with other people, just went to the field for seven years for 310, 320 days a year and coached girls until they were old enough to coach others. And you know, maybe there are other ways of doing it, but you know, to what Tabo was saying about you know vetting. Um, there, there is no police type of vetting, you know, where we work. I, I remember, you know, asking a local, um, you know, police station head um, about his crime, his crime map with the pins in it, and and I said, I, I don't see murder or rape, you know, on here. And he said, Do you mean love rape? And I said, Well, I don't know what that is, but you know, since I've I've found out what people think that is, and and I said, What about murder? He said, Well, that mostly happens within families. So in, in such a place, you know, how do you vet where, where girls and women are afraid to go to the, you know, local police, uh, where they don't feel like they have, you know, even preference, preferences or a voice? Uh, how do you make it safe? It's, we don't have all the answers, but we try to be honest about our, you know, our positives and negatives and, and try to create as many very strong uh, communication lines um, with as many female staff as possible, and uh, and then continuously check and and uh, 
just understand that, you know, we, we won't always get it right, but we'll certainly try. Thank you. For, oh, go ahead, Tim. I was going to say thank you, Franz. I don't know if I can kind of chip in and feed back into here and kind of put, diff well, I'd say similar experiences, a similar insight. But I think for us, the key that's kind of really worked is, and this is the way that we work, is really, really deeply understanding the cultural needs. And I mean cultural needs beyond beyond the group of girls that we're working with. So what are the cultural norms? What normally happens? And so once we've kind of got a deep understanding of that, we can kind of plan for any anything incident that could happen. And I think it goes back to what Ollie said as well, creating that trust and that safe so space is critical. And the way that we've done it is by really understanding how the culture works and accepting and respecting the culture, not going in there going, I'm, I'm gonna come in here and change this whole culture through boxing. No, it's more, I'm coming here, I see the benefit, how do I work within your culture to help implement this? And so for us, there was an the education piece, you know, I'm, I'm Kurdish, I know all the rules back home, but I still don't know the full rules. There'll be things happening that I just do not understand. So I, heavily heavily rely on my local staff and I only hire locally I never ever hire anyone else from the region unless they're local and we go as far as hiring from within the camps so we've got eyes and ears in the camps and it's not just relied on one person so for us I guess the, the le learning and sharing is is that the deeper that you go into the community the more eyes and ears that you have within that program and the more access to communication lines, different communication lines. So we've got the compliance box, we've got a, we've got an, a safeguarding email address, we've got a safeguarding point person. If they can't talk to this person, they can talk to the other person. Um, so we created really different avenues for it to be possible to speak to somebody. Um, the police checks go just as far as, yeah, then they've not murdered anyone, they've not raped anyone, they've, they've not committed any crimes. But like you say, things can happen that are outside of that, which is still massive safeguarding issues. So we've kind of tried to do various things to kind of catch them. But it goes also back to the education piece. So in a one of the projects that we implemented, which was a really big and important project, and I wish we could see more of it and there'd be more funding available for it, is it was a prevention of sexual violence um, project, but it was to educate the community that we work in to safeguard themselves against NGO workers. <laughs> so against other people, other people that work with the community that kind of serve them in a good way and try to help them, but they need to understand when that help has kind of gone beyond that line and they know what they can do beyond then. So for me, having that education piece is really critical because you need to kind of accept and also for the staff to know that the community is empowered to share information about them if they've done something wrong but if the community don't know that then it's harder for them to kind of come forward um so i guess in response to franz and kind of sharing insights it's more trying to go at it from so many different angles there isn't just one solution and there won't be one solution it's it's different elements being pulled in together um and and that's the way i guess we've 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 approached it I really love the, that that point with, that you can come at it from lots of different angles, and that was that was so important for our program in terms of we want to understand what what are the real issues that these children are, are dealing with, and first it involved building building trust, getting them into a safe space, them feeling empowered and safe in that space. And then our way of doing it was to incorporate art-based programming. And so when the kids were doing drawings, they were doing drawings of the corrupt policeman. They were doing drawings of the forced marriage of somebody in their family. They were doing a drawing of and, and, and then and they did uh, plays and we did a whole lot of different sort of arts-based activities that helped it sort of get out because it wasn't always easy to just talk about 
something that happened, something that traumatic that happened. And uh, the, the arts-based activities were really effective in terms of like taking the pulse, understanding what was important to these kids, what were they really worried about, what were they... Um, we, we, we actually did a, a really interesting uh, uh, exercise in the classroom in 2000 and I think it was 2009, 2010. It was before the, it was still the Millennium Development Goals. And we showed the kids the, the MDCs and said, what do you think of them? And they said, where is safety? There's no point. Where is security? You, all of those things are, are, are nice, but if we don't have security, we can't have any of them. We're like, whoa, wow, okay, you, you guys are 10 and you're telling us <laughs> how to get our priorities straight. Um, so that, that really sort of brought home like how much the kids understand about the challenges that they face in their, their community, what is important, and then helping them sort of express themselves and, and get those stories out so that you can design programs that actually mean something to those communities. Thank you, Oli. Thank you, Tavan. I love that the conversation just feels like it could keep going. I think you've both touched on something really important, which is talking to girls, actually asking them what's affecting them and to keep talking and to use innovative methods like art um, to keep the conversation going when hard topics are too hard to talk about, or there may be really a cultural silence around it. We're coming to a close. I want to also invite you to look at the chat. Atalanti asked a great question around, what about jealousy? What about pushback? And um, when doesn't it work? Um, and so uh, I think that's a really wonderful conversation that I would like to take forward with some of the panelists separately. Let me just ask each panelist as we close to give one sort of closing thought of what would it take to take, get your program to really the next level? What would you like to see happen? Um, and then, final words you might have so just closing um, sentence from all of you a big thank you to the amazing uh, participants i've so enjoyed the chat i feel a real sense of warmth and care and belief in what you're doing um, panelists so i think you can feel really proud and i really love the humility and the honesty of today's conversation it really touched me so some closing thoughts i'm going to start with you france then to Van. Sure. So uh, the, the question that keeps me up at night and uh, my wife as well, uh, I think that um, that we face the same challenge that entrepreneurs across different fields, uh, whether it's corporate or nonprofit face, and that's um, that we we wear too many hats, so to speak. We're trying to do uh, too many things. We get spread thin. We um, we're constantly recruiting. Uh, constantly fundraising, trying to to build the the stool, the three legged stool that that Ali mentioned, and um, and I think uh, in the way that uh, things are structured in India for fundraising, uh, it's always one year, one year, one year. So we're always chasing uh, fundraising, even with long term funders. Uh, so we uh, we're in a catch twenty two where we need we need more staff to get the funding to build out the program more. And we need more funding to hire the staff to build out the program more. So it's, um, it's a bit of a gerbil, gerbil wheel uh, that, that we find ourselves on. And, um, and I think we, we have a lot of the right pieces in place in terms of uh, culture, uh, safeguarding, quality, impact, uh, and proof, uh, you know, track record up to this point. And the, the next steps for us are are more administrative that we need to bring on uh, longer term uh, partners, funding partners who and capacity building partners who are a good fit, um, and and building out our administration so that we're uh, we're able to uh, you know continue to grow in you know and, and project uh, uh, you know our, our plans a little bit further into the future instead of always being chasing. Your friends. Um, I think everybody can resonate with that. We just need more people, more funds, more expertise and more partnerships um, to back. Thank you, friends. I definitely agree with every single thing that you've said. And actually it goes back to, I think we need to understand the importance of how sport can have a powerful impact on an individual, but also community. And then also, a country right so 
it's recognizing that and starting to see that, but we can't do that impact. We can't have that impact if we're not supported. If, if we don't have those donors that see, okay, the long-term impact for this is this, because it is a long-term impact. Yes, you will see short-term um, success stories, but the profound long-term impact on that is, is really, really big. And I think we need to recognize that for us to be able to empower girls and women from the inside, I think sport is a, is such a powerful tool to do that. And we underestimate it. Sadly, we really do underestimate it. It's an area that's underfunded. Um, it's an area that really isn't kind of the first thing that donors will go for. Um, we have to push back and say, no, our programs are holistic. Our centers have to have some of these programs. It's the way that we run. It's the way that we have impact long-term. And we see how the impact goes through different areas. Um, and for me, I'd love to see a Kurdish boxer who's a girl, who becomes a global boxer. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, wouldn't that be amazing? I think if more girls had access to boxing, I'd love to take skating there. Let's break another barrier, Oliver. Um, so breaking the barriers and actually just visually. So going back to Atlantis question, how do the boys see it? You'll be surprised. Just the fact that they stay outside of our camp area and they see these girls going in with their boxing gloves just for them to see that the impact is massive because when we started working with men and boys the reason I started it is I noticed that in these camps we were implement implementing the projects for the women and girls but there was a particular group of boys and it was teenage boys I'd say from around 10 to 14 that were just hanging around doing nothing, just hanging around. There was no programs for them. And it made me think these boys get their insight and role modeling and inspiration from the older men and the older generation who have very conservative views about women. And actually it goes back to the point of safety. So a lot of the women and girls aren't allowed to go out of their tents and cabins because they don't feel safe for them to go out. So they become stricter on them. So I thought, how do you change their mindset? It's such a critical age where they need to be seeing girls in different roles for them to slowly start realizing, oh, girls can do this as well. It's all right. Yes, they do. They do get really jealous and they're like, can you create a program for us? And the answer is not yet. Um, but we have other services for them, like art therapy, music therapy, um, lots of um, mental health support. So we do try and cater for that on that side. But I think just visually seeing the girls box is changing something within them already. Thank you so much, Tabana. I'm going to put this in the good hands of Atalanti to close us with Ollie. Sorry to interrupt. I'm going to run and catch my plane. Um, it was just an amazing, amazing conversation. Thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. I'll be really, yeah, really quick. Uh, I mean, we're really, fo really focused on um, unrestricted giving and being able to then also give in an unrestricted way to other community-based grassroots organisations because I think that that's where the the magic really, really happens. So this is that that's a big focus for us because we don't want to tie up people doing really good work on the ground in and you know in administration that's not uh, that's that's not necessary um there's there's a lot of people doing fantastic work all over the world and uh, i want to work out how we can support more of them really fast and fast and easily so that's the that's the big focus for us really great to be part of the the, the panel today thanks so much for the invitation thank you Thank you, Lauren, who's now gone, who is always an amazing moderator. She picks up on all the subtleties and the difficulties. Thank you to the amazing panel. I feel that magic happened today on the screen. And, you know, people ask me, why are we doing these panels? What's the purpose of these panels? And the purpose of these panels is first to highlight the amazing work of some of the organizations that we know or meet with. But the other part is really to build up collaborations and exchanges of knowledge. And this happened today so organically and so richly, but it only happened because all three of you were so honest. And I have to say, Lauren really picked up on, I felt the honesty, the sincerity, 
and the authenticity with which you spoke about your challenges, your successes, your passion is really, really what builds up the trust. Trust came up all the time. We were talking about trust, the importance of creating trust between the beneficiaries, between the people that are doing the work. And I think one of the things that came up very, very strongly as well is the need uh, when we're working in whatever communities that we're working in, that we have to engage with the communities to be the ones that are doing the programs. And so I think there's so many rich things. Our audience are, were amazing. There was clearly a whole group out there that wants to connect with you all and to find ways to collaborate. And this is really, really one of the main purposes of the Giving Room panels is to convene really great practitioners, people with enormous commitment, who transfer their enthusiasm and their passion to get more people behind the movement. So thank you for fulfilling your roles in in a bond, you know, if you were in school, you get beyond expectations. <laughs> so thank you so, so much. Ollie, I wish you all the best for the new baby that's arriving. And please keep us posted about this. France will definitely keep in touch because it's wonderful right. to meet you finally. And let's work together and Taban, who is part of the Giving Women group anyway. So um, I would like to thank everybody, our participants and our panelists and the wonderful Lauren. And Kathleen, thank you for all the back work that you're oh, doing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so this was really great. Really, really great. great. Thank, you. thank you. Have thank a good you. lunch, breakfast, dinner. Yeah. Bye-bye. <laughs>